Hello guys, long time no see. I really hoped for this video to come way sooner, but hey, life happened. Also, thanks a lot for your very positive comments on my first video, I hope you liked this video too. In the past few weeks, I did a library called libipc. This library provides inter-process communications, making processes to exchange messages. I create a service and clients can talk to it. Simple. No need to dig too much into what this library actually does for now. I'll explain that in another video. However, this piece of code forced me to explore many aspects of Zig. Today, I'll provide a feedback on what I actually used, not in any particular order. Despite making a video on Zig almost two years ago, I didn't code in Zig since then. So, this library is from the point of view of someone just starting for real with Zig. And I hope you'll find this interesting. Quick reminder. Zig still isn't ready for production. However, probably everything you've learned a few years back on the language itself is still valid. Changes happen mostly in the standard library. So, as you can see in this video, we'll talk about a lot of things, but don't worry, there will be a lot of chapters, so you can skip to whatever you want. In this video, I won't talk about parallelism and concurrency stuff, mostly because I didn't use them, and I won't talk about the build system, because I think it's a big subject. I'll probably do a dedicated video about this. So, from C to Zig. libipc was firstly developed in C. Code wasn't too horrible, but quite redundant. I repeated a few things regarding error cases. Every function returned a structure with a code, which was an iteration telling if an error happened or not, and eventually an error message. To avoid this redundancy, I did some macros, but it quickly did get out of hand. I'm not too ashamed of my C library, but I wasn't confident either, even though my tests worked. I rewrote the library in Zig and redundancy was gone. But since both libraries aren't exactly the same, and I'll spare you the details, it's hard to make a fair comparison. Let's say that despite my macros, the C library was about 2000 lines, and my Zig library is about half that. I think that for the same features, a rough estimate would be about 40% fewer lines in the Zig version. So the code doesn't have ugly macros and still would be 40% smaller. Let's talk about documentation for a bit. Official documentation of the standard library improved a lot since my last video. For example, when browsing function signatures, structures can be clicked on, leading to their documentation. That's very basic, but hey, it wasn't there. However, documentation is still experimental, and there is a massive room for improvement. I'll give you a few examples I encountered during the development of libipc, but it's fine since it was completely expected and Zig developers said it several times. Work has kinda just begun on documentation. As a first example, let's follow std.multiarray list. We can see this function. What is self? Self is this. This doesn't say much, but this is fine since it is everywhere in the standard library. Self means the current structure. Okay, but what is field? Mm, okay, and up to this, when field enum is selected, there is a list of a single parameter which is a type, but Parameters of what? There's no function here. So documentation is still confusing or maybe just a bit broken on some parts. Documentation can also be frustrating regarding types that are related to a specific operating system, basically all C types. I was searching for a type. This type depends on a subtype, which depends on the operating system, which ultimately cannot be documented automatically. But again, that's fine, these C types can easily be found in the code, the ultimate source of truth. Finally, some other types aren't currently documented. For example, writer types, such as in std.fs.file, are 
array list aligned. But I think I know why this one is a bit odd to document. We'll see that later. So what's the state of documentation? I'd say that it came to the point where it's actually useful. I don't remember reading the documentation at all a few years ago. Now, I do use it and it works for me almost every time. I just presented a few examples where documentation failed, so you won't be surprised. Paint is still wet. So, how to produce this documentation? One way I used is this. This creates a directory with the documentation of our program, and to serve it, I use docshtpd. And thanks to the ZIG documentation being a web application, there are no latencies whatsoever. That's really great to switch from a page to another without waiting at all. Some shortcuts make the browsing delightful, even though it's not perfect in any way. A search doesn't provide the most useful results, scrolling is often required. Objection! Besides the official documentation of the ZIG standard library, a few other documentations popped up over the years. I mostly used one of them, ziglearn.org, which is a good source since there are a few examples. But it's not up to date and it seems stale. No new chapters in a very long time. I wanted to learn how to do bindings, meaning building ZIG code to use it in C and other languages. I wanted to do that more than a year ago and it was missing in the chapter 4, and still is. Also, I wanted to learn about the event loop, since libipc is built upon it, but bad luck, there isn't documentation of that either. I finally did my own event loop, which only is a simple call to the poll syscall, and that will be fine for now. So let's see a few language constructions. Using anonymous structures as options is widespread in the standard API, since it's really convenient. An example of this can be seen in the std.net namespace. An anonymous structure is used as an associative array of optional parameters. No need to instantiate a server.options structure. Again, code like this is everywhere in the standard library. The or else keyword helps writing clear code. It is working with an optional value, and in the case the value is null, the right part of the keyword is executed. Or else is a small improvement from C that makes the code slightly more concise using a simple and widespread construct. And with differ and R differ keywords, previous allocations can be safely freed without explicit reference in the OR case. Also, you can use or else to provide a default value. This construction already exists in many other languages, it was just missing for C, and that's fixed. First, I really like the compiler, it's crazy fast. My workflow is based on not paying any attention to the documentation regarding errors, but just trusting the compiler. The compiler tells me what are the possible errors, then I choose what to do. For example, some errors can be safely ignored, like this. Like when I try to create a directory that already exists. Another pretty similar example, working with environment variables. I want to do stuff if some environment variable is set, IPC network. And there are three possible cases. First thing, the variable exists. It is pushed in the network and var variable and the function goes on. Second, the variable doesn't exist, and in this case, it's still fine. I just return from the current function. Last case, there is a problem that isn't just missing environment variable. It could be serious, like being out of memory, so I return the error. So, a few functions I used. Uh, first thing, why do I talk about this? because out-of-context built-in functions could be intimidating, especially for people coming from high-level languages. But once you actually encounter the problem to solve, they are completely natural to use. A built-in is just a function that comes directly from the compiler, no need to import anything, and that's it. Why are they useful? There is a video about this by Lois Core called A Look at Zig's Built-ins. 
posted two years ago. For example, I used a few built-ins, such as as, mostly because I had to manage low-level code. The as built-in is for type coercion. In clear terms, you tell the compiler you know types are different, but they are compatible, so it has to perform a safe conversion. As is useful in many cases, so you'll probably use it, but most built-ins are specific. Don't feel overwhelmed by reading the Zig reference. We can safely ignore them for now. Despite the fact that I did low-level code, I only used a few built-ins. Zig API looks like libc API. A good thing coming from C, Zig standard library provides a similar API you're used to. Open, read, mem, copy, mkd, unlink. And it works the same way on all operating systems. Yes, even on Windows, despite not really using file descriptors. More on that later. And in the case you want to call the libc directly, you can do it with the std.c namespace. From now and then, I want to know the duration of some operations. In C, this involves a structure that isn't as simple as it could be. In the Zig standard library, this is a simple structure, timer, that does the job perfectly. Logging. As we saw in some examples, a logging system can be used to provide runtime information. This can be an error, a warning, an information or a debug message. STD.log is straightforward. Depending on the compilation mode, some of these instructions may or may not be compiled. For example, unless in debug mode, debug prints won't be compiled. Your logs can also be scoped, meaning that you can provide a bit of context. In this case, you create a log structure that can be called as std.log, but printed string will have a short prefix. A structure I used a few times, a list. I just needed to store a dynamic list of something. This is an example of about everything I did with our lists. Init, append, loop over items, remove an item based on its index, and then free the array. Very straightforward, simple. Also, at some point, I had to create two array lists, sharing their indexes. Why? Forget about it. I will spare you the details. But in this case, a multi array list structure, advertised many times by Andrew, seems relevant. So I'll probably use it in a near future. Networking structures. Networking is performed through a few main structures. Stream server and stream structures represent a server and a client. They enable working with sockets and their specific error set, and that's mostly it. After that, there is the address structure, which is generic enough to handle different addressing, such as IPv4, IPv6, and also Unix socket path. Having worked with C networking structures in the past, I have to say, this is an improvement. And why is this so great to use while it was a pain in the ass in C? Several reasons, because Zig has default values for structure attributes, anonymous structures used as options, dotted notation and namespaces, and surely because of the error system. None of that being complex features. Testing code in Zig really is simple. Test code blocks in the standard library taught me most of the language, and for a first tab at an API, that's great. I won't show to you merge tests. Just read standard library tests. Unix sockets that I use intensively in libipc can share a file descriptor to another process. A server can open a file or a socket then send it to a client, for example. This rather obscure property is actually used in libipc. I did a few functions to exchange file descriptors thanks to a few editors. They provided me parts of very specialized low-level code that I completed. 
Clearly, my code isn't perfect in any way, but it works. I wanted to talk about this because I think it is useful to have this in the standard library, so if you have time, please be my guest and make it happen. Code is free. Some big subject here. A well-designed operating system provides abstractions to painlessly work with your hardware. That's almost its entire job, to create a simple environment for developers. Working with files is a good example of this. Opening a file is asking for a file to your kernel. You provide a path, your kernel provides a number on Unix systems and Linux. Why a number? Because it is related to a table your kernel has regarding your process. Number 0 is your input when you type something on your keyboard. Number 1 is your standard output when you print stuff. Number 2 is your error output. And when you open files, you get new numbers, 3, 4, 5, etc. Then, to read or to write something in your file, you use this number to tell what file you are working on. So, to write something in your file, you write something like this. And a socket is just another entry in the same table. Direct benefit of this, you can use the exact same functions as before. A socket is a number which you can use exactly as any other file descriptor. So, I repeat, on Unix and Linux, the API is simple. You get a number for whatever you wanted to reach, socket or file, then you have access to a set of read and write functions. And that's it. Simple. Elegant. Nice, but why am I talking about this? Because of course it's different on Windows. And I think that's one of the main reasons why it is so difficult to write portable code. We have beautiful abstractions on well-designed operating systems that we cannot use anymore. Thus, the language, or its standard library, has to overcome differences between operating systems. It is forced to drop the simple and elegant API and make its own. Doing portable code involves some complexity. But good news everyone! The Zig standard library actually handles this complexity for us, and the std.os namespace is full of simple portable functions. The API tends to be as simple as on Linux and Unix systems, while being mostly portable. That's even one of the things that got me interested in Zig a few years back. Also, complexity in the Zig standard library is stacked. Let me explain. In Zig, you can access syscalls directly. No sugar. See the std.c namespace. But if you want to benefit from the Zig error system and to get mostly portable code, you can use the std.os namespace, which is more or less direct syscalls with a very light overlay. Finally, a more modern approach could be considered with specialized structures for everything. The standard library provides structures such as file, stream server, and so on. Zing can also look like high-level code, as an object-oriented language, for example. So if you want just C, you have it. If you want portable C with a less dumb error management, you have it. And if you want a library with high-level structures with tons of specialized functions, you have it too. As we'll see, having high-level structures doesn't imply too much code redundancy. Reader and Writer Structures These both structures are very nice to read and to write streams of binary data. Reader and Writer are especially relevant for network packets, since they are just serialized data. The UDP protocol, for example, is described in a simple three-page RFC. Its format is source, port, desk port, length, and checksum. In Zing, using a writer may look like this. That way, you don't have to handle an index, which is one of the perks of these structures. Reader and writer are also relevant to read and to write any file with a binary format. In this case, you can open a file and get a writer structure out of it. 
So reader and writer structures are a convenient way to read and to write streams of data, files, network, in-memory data, logs, etc. LibIPC is particularly simple in that regard. A LibIPC packet is a length and an upper layer payload. That's it. Even UDP is more complex than that. Sometimes I wanted a writer structure for in-memory data. But that can be a bit complicated. In the case you just want a snprintf function, meaning to print in a buffer, there's buff print for that. Now, the good news. You can actually see the documentation for a writer. The writer within std.io is correctly documented. And it's also quite confusing because it's a function returning a structure. This structure actually is used to create other writers. Let me explain. This writer function is a way to create writer structures, all having the same API, the same functions. Why not just using a writer structure once and for all? Because depending on where you write data, you'll get different errors. What can fail when writing to a file is different to what can fail writing to the network. Also, writing to a file is different from writing to an array list structure. But because everything is kind of the same besides that, only three parameters are needed for this function to provide a writer structure in all kinds of situations. As you see in this function signature, three compile time known parameters are required. The context, meaning the type of the structure where to write data, such as a file, a buffer, or socket. The second parameter is a set of errors that can happen when writing data. Finally, the function to actually write data. Both context and write error are used within the function signature writefn. That is valid code and typing is verified by the compiler. I wanted to show to you this function because std.io.writer is a good example of generic programming. That's a way to ensure a consistent API across different situations without requiring either new concepts, such as interfaces, or code redundancy. Sure, there is a comp time concept, meaning that a parameter has to be known at compile time and can be a type instead of a variable, but that's manageable, and there is no need to introduce object-oriented programming just for that, for example. A function returns a structure, both being trivial and pervasive concepts in almost every known programming language. As you probably guessed by now, the reader is the exact same thing. Now we know about reader and writer, let's see an example. You have a function which writes stuff. Whatever it could be, like logs, serverless data, anything, you may want to write a function that is writing to a writer instead of writing directly to your target. This way, the code can now be tested and even used in different contexts. So, let's say you want to write a function taking a writer as a parameter. What is the type of the writer? You want your function to work with any writer not just the file.writer structure, for example. One easy answer to that is to write any type as its type, and you're good to go. That's a little hack I used since I wasn't sure about the right type, and it works. That's basically duct taping. Next big subject, bindings. A binding is a way to use code from another language. Most general purpose languages can use code, functions, and structures, for example, from C, if they write bindings for it. How this translates in actual code depends on the language. For example, Zig can directly import C code, 
no need for bindings. In Crystal, a binding is a simple function signature declaration. But in my case, I want to enable other languages to use my library written in Zig. To that end, we can export a Zig function this way. Thanks to this, it is possible to call Zig code from any language which can call C code, including the C language. I made a Git repository with an example of this without any sugar, so the different interactions can be understood. This shows how to create a library in Zig which can be imported everywhere. I didn't try to export structures, though. Just functions. I encountered a few confusing errors. I had the presence of mind to keep a trace of at least one of them, but keep in mind that this doesn't matter much. Development was fairly straightforward and painless. I got the following error when the result of a function call fetch swap remove was a single value anonymous hash. This error is just plain confusing. It didn't help one bit. I got another error when I had a function with a large array located in the stack. I guess this broke the compiler since it runs some of the code at compilation time, but I tried to recreate the error and it doesn't fail anymore. So I guess this was fixed. Lastly, since I did some networking code, I wanted to print an hexadecimal dump of packets I sent or received. I used a library I just copy-paste, but it wasn't working properly, so I kind of rewrote the whole thing. It's not in a separate repository, but you can copy-paste it. You're welcome. Conclusion My experience is simple. Coming from C, I saw no drawbacks working with Zig at all. An experienced C developer can use Zig as in C, and it would still be more concise and readable. I even bet the generated binary would be almost similar. In case you want to enjoy the Zig error system, as I advise you to, you can use the std.os namespace, and maybe a few other namespaces such as std.mem. To me, that's a sweet spot. And if you want more, the standard library provides many convenient and portable structures. All of that without introducing any new complex concepts. So my point of view hasn't changed since my first video. Zig really is C without the bullshit, and I'm now even more confident to say it. To be fair, I don't know if there is a domain where Zig really is outstanding. I will use it instead of C for writing libraries and system applications, programs I want to see working on all operating systems and architectures, including constraints ones, such as some routers or something. But I do prefer other languages, such as Common Lisp, Haskell, and so on. But I consider the Zig tooling to be a better fit for system programming. Also, most problems I mentioned, such as documentation, are well known and expected. So, my other projects. I did a learn X in Y minutes on Zig a freaking year ago, but it's not working because of some bullshit with syntax highlighting, a library that wasn't properly updated. It may or may not change soon. Besides, I want to continue doing videos on Zig, at least a few on the build system, for example, maybe the network API, async, and a few other things. As a side note, about the build system. To me, this resonates a lot with the Zig build system. Some consider it great, I have my concerns. Since it's a big subject, I'll dedicate an entire video on the matter. Besides Zig, I spent a certain amount of time doing all the stuff I want to talk about. Sure, I did libipc and I want to talk about it. I did it to serve as a foundation for the rewrite of NetLibre, NetLibre, Free the Network, which is a website I did eight years ago to provide free domain names, currently in Perl, 
and French, and I want to rewrite it in Zig and probably Crystal and PureScript. Also, I had a lot of fun doing a package builder based on make files for a toy operating system. I learned Rough, which is an excellent tool to produce documents, first developed in the 70s, and I want to talk about it. And I did a template to help new users getting started with Rough. And with Ruff, I started a book on Haskell. And I did a few book reviews and summaries. I learned Lisp, and mostly common Lisp, and I played with it doing a database library to store documents. No SQL, no DBMS, no dependencies, with indexes mapped on the file system. Some things that I already did in Crystal too. Also, do you know Cibor? Cibor is a very efficient serialization library, a binary JSON. Probably the most concise, simple, and efficient serialization format ever. Well, I did transparent bindings to Cibor for the Crystal language, meaning that you can automatically serialize and deserialize any Crystal object in Cibor. So I think we can toy with it a bit. So as you can see, I did stuff, I want to do stuff, and I think it's time to share it with you. So I'll try to post more videos, more frequently than once every two years at least. It really is good to be back. As the last time, everything I talked about can be found in the links below. And if you want to talk, you can post comments.